This is Save Yourself with Dr. Amy Shaw. This is the place we're going to be discussing changes in our body that happen during midlife and beyond. We're going to be talking about the nutritional strategies, the medical strategies, the science behind it all. Thank you for your interest. All right. So we're back with another episode of Save Yourself with Dr. Amy Shaw. I want to thank you guys so much for being here. And this is a very exciting episode because this is an episode that a lot of you have been asking me for. It's the nutritional protocol. It's the perimenopause protocol for nutrition. It's a mouthful, but really I'm going to get into the specifics of how to organize your nutrition to optimize your health, especially in your late 30s, your 40s, your 50s, and beyond. This is a protocol to improve your energy, to improve your brain, to improve your cardiovascular function. As we age, we seem to go down on some of these areas, especially if we're not proactively building building that. So for example, your muscle mass will go down one to 3% a year instead of one to 3% per decade. Once you get into the perimenopausal transition, your brain health will decline at astronomical rates during the menopausal transition. Your ability to walk a flight of stairs, your cardiovascular fitness will decline as you age, unless you counteract that, okay? We need to counteract that with nutrition, with exercise, with lifestyle. So I'm going to give you the basic protocol that everyone should know. I wish everyone in the world knew about this because it is something that is going to set the stage for the best years of your life. So let's get into it. But before we get into all of that, I wanted to thank our sponsor. We have an amazing sponsor, Truly Nutrition. There is a drink that they have that's made of turmeric, ginger, all of the spices that I love. It is in that drink. It is sugar-free. It has no additives. It's called the Wellness Shot. It's at trulean.com, T-R-U-L-E-A-N.com. We'll put the links in the show notes. But if you use the code DRSHA50, D-R-S-H-A-H-50, one word, you get 50% off. I'm so grateful to them because I love the Wellness Shot and they were the first to believe in me and this podcast. And I know you guys have been so supportive because this is a no cost to you platform where you get to get all the best information, something much more than you can get on the internet and actually hopefully more useful for you. So these are some actionable steps and I'm going to get into all of that, but I want to thank Trulene. Make sure you use the code Dr. Shah 50. Second announcement is the protein chai is out. It is a chai protein plus. We came out with very limited quantities. When we had the chai launch party, we was such a hit, literally was gone within minutes of us introducing it. So we're super excited that it's available now on amymdwellness.com. It is delicious, 100 calories, 20 grams of protein, zero sugar. It is something that will help you through the day. It's been something that everyone's been asking me for. And so I'm so happy that it's out. Okay, let's get into it. The nutritional protocol. Okay, so when you are going through the perimenopausal transition, so some of you who haven't heard my other episodes or don't even know what perimenopause is, it's the shift in your hormones that happens as early as your late 30s, but definitely in your 40s, definitely in your 50s, 60s, and beyond. And these changes happen slowly. It's not like one day you just hit menopause and everything changes. These things are happening over years. Um, average amount of time is around 10 years that women will feel symptoms. Of course, men go through a gradual transition like this too. It's just not as dramatic as women's transition. I think it's interesting for people to know that humans are pretty much the only species on planet Earth besides a couple of types of whales that go through menopause and live years after menopause. Men and women go through age-related changes, but for women, it just seems to be more like markedly noticeable in their symptoms. If you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond, this episode is for you. So first things first, let's think about what the problem is here. We seem to have worse perimenopausal symptoms 
than before. And this was seen in a cohort in Switzerland where they actually asked groups of people how their symptoms were. And then 20 years later, they asked a group of people how their symptoms were. And so they said, yes, it's getting more common to talk about it. But in a research study, I think they would have the same amount of time, energy, and chance to talk about it. So we're definitely noticing that things are getting worse. And anecdotally, you know, people are talking about it more. They're going to their doctor more. So there's definitely some talk about why is it getting worse? And one of the reasons we think it's getting worse is nutrition. Our nutrition has changed. We're eating a lot more ultra processed foods, 60 to 70% of foods that the average American eats is ultra processed. And that goes up to like 75% for adolescents. So ultra processed foods, those are foods that are, you cannot recreate it in your kitchen. It's the Doritos, it's the Oreos, it's the shakes, the Frappuccinos. It's the things that you cannot recreate. Even if you had every ingredient in your kitchen, everything available to you, you would not be able to recreate that food. That is an ultra processed food. And if you think about it, there's a lot of those things. And, you know, cakes and cookies and packaged goods are ultra processed. So first things first, if you take down your level of ultra processed foods, the amount of ultra processed foods you're having in a day, that alone will improve your menopausal symptoms is also decrease your risk of death. So for every 10% you decrease your ultra processed food consumption, you get a 14% increase in your life expectancy. Imagine that just by decreasing the amount of ultra processed foods you eat, you automatically extend your life in most cases. And so if you think about it, that's the first thing you should be doing is thinking of ways, hey, instead of having that processed, I'll just take an example, Oreo, is there something that I can eat that equally is satisfying to me that it's unprocessed or less processed. Let's put it that way because it's almost impossible to get unprocessed food these days. So that's one tip that I'll give you right off the bat. But really, if you want to know what the actionable tips are, the start is a 3F morning. What is a 3F morning? It's how you should start your day every day. If you did nothing else, the 3F morning would get you on your day in a way that your nutrition would be set, your mindset, your brain, and your body would be thriving. So let's talk about this. Three Fs. So the first F is circadian fasting. This means that eat an early dinner, take a break from food overnight, and then eat breakfast in the morning. Seems simple. And for perimenopausal women, I would start with just 12 hours and then extend from there as you see fit for you. So a 6 p.m. dinner to a 6 or 7 a.m. breakfast, a 7 p.m. dinner to a 7 or 8 a.m. breakfast. So very, very simple way to improve your health. Our bodies need a rest from food. You cannot do the deep cleaning in your cells when you have food coming in all the time. Gut rest was something we did very, very commonly. Thousands of years ago, there was no refrigerators, no Uber Eats and microwaves. So we had to take a rest. There was absolutely nothing we could really do except very, very small amount of food overnight. This drastically changed in the last 100 years, but definitely the last 50 years where there is food consumption at all hours of the night. And a lot of people are eating the majority of their calories late in the evening. And then they're not giving their body enough rest and they're starting to eat early in the morning. We know that there's so much data around circadian rhythms, the rhythms that our body works on and improving your food timing. So you really want to do, if you do nothing else, just take a break from food for 12 hours, that will improve your health. The second F is fitness. Taking a few minutes every day to go outside, get sunlight, walk, and start your day that way. If you do nothing else, you have accomplished more than most Americans. We now know that when you get sunlight into your eyes, it goes straight to your brain to reset your circadian rhythms for the day. We have clocks in every single one of our cells, but that main brain clock will tell the rest of the clocks what time it is and retune those clocks. When your clocks are retuned, you feel alert and awake and happy and you actually improve your sleep that night. So fitness is the next one. And then the third F is the one we're really going to deep dive into today. It's the food. You want fiber, fermented, high protein breakfast. So if you do nothing else in your day with nutrition, but you start your day with a high protein, high fiber, and high probiotic food breakfast, you have done something for yourself that will improve your gut health, your brain health, and 
your hormone health. So I know you're probably thinking, what does that even mean? Fermented food? What's the difference between probiotic food and fermented food? And how much fiber? How do we get fiber? That's what we're really going to get into today. I'm also going to talk about some superfoods and some amazing mind-blowing research about things that maybe you want to include once you've gotten this 3F morning down. All right, so let's talk about it. What's the difference between a fermented food and a probiotic food? Back in the day, fermented meant probiotic, meaning that there was no way for us to really pickle something and you know keep it good without actually having live bacteria. Now we can have pickles that go straight in the fridge. It's just vinegar and there's no live bacteria. So pickled food is not necessarily always fermented. And probiotic food is kind of the better way to say it now, where it's fermented food that actually contains real bacteria. That bacteria goes to your gut. It supports your brain health. It supports your hormone health. It supports your digestive health. It supports your muscle health, all of it. Okay. So you want, and that is one of the most important parts of your diet. And most people don't even know this information. So what is a probiotic food. The simplest one is yogurt. Yeah, most yogurts, except for the ones with M&Ms and the, you know, sugar in it is probiotic. In America, we actually have to label anything that actually has live bacteria on it. So you can easily tell if a yogurt has probiotic cultures or if it actually has bacteria in it because it's labeled on the container itself. Probiotic cottage cheese. So there's some brands in the U.S., Nancy's, this is not sponsored by Nancy's, or there's Good Culture. There's a few probiotic cottage cheeses. They're a little more tart, but they're delicious, and they actually have live bacteria that can count as your probiotic food. Then there is raw apple cider vinegar. Really easy. Raw apple cider vinegar in a salad dressing or in a glass of water, or add it to your recipes. This is such a great way to get probiotics into your diet. And then kimchi, sauerkraut, taking a forkful of sauerkraut a day. That's something that can improve your health in so many ways. Like you can add it to the side of your breakfast. You can add it to your salad. You can just take a forkful in the morning like I do often. And that's a way to add probiotic food. Kombucha. Kombucha is a great substitute for soda. However, you know, you have to watch out for the sugar levels. There are kombuchas that are, have 10 grams of sugar per serving. You want to avoid high sugar kombuchas, but kombucha can be a nice treat, especially when you want something that is not a soda. But be careful, you know, the sugar can definitely add up. There's so many other options now for probiotic foods and fermented foods. If you go to your local health food store, like Whole Foods, or sprouts is something that we have here, you can go through and see all the sections of actual probiotic foods. It's not as hard to get as it was years ago. But if you're in a place where you don't have access to a lot of these things, then the raw apple cider vinegar, like the one that says with the mother or a, a nice high quality yogurt or a probiotic cottage cheese will be great for you. So that's the probiotic part. You want probiotics because they seed your gut. They go into the colon where they need to go. They actually add bacteria there. We're consistently getting rid of bacteria in our gut because we're taking antibiotics so often. And even things like pesticides, for example, are killing our gut bacteria. Um, it's very sad to think about it, but some of these tryptophan, some of these dopamine containing bacteria get killed um, when you're eating pesticide laden food, which is also an organic food, by the way, organic pesticide do exist. So but definitely in conventional food for sure. So you want to be replacing your gut bacteria all the time with the foods that you eat. The other thing besides probiotic food is fiber. And I know fiber is something that we've been talking more about, especially in perimenopause. We know that as your hormones change in perimenopause and menopause, your estrogen level goes down and that affects your gut microbiome. Your gut microbiome suffers during menopause. Your gut microbiome loses bacteria during menopause. Your gut bacteria is the reason that you will notice, oh, my vitamin D is low. Oh my gosh, my cholesterol is high. Oh my God, my blood sugar went high. My hemoglobin A1C is higher. Oh my God, I'm not getting the micronutrients that I used to. It's because your gut bacteria are changing during perimenopause and you have to counteract that by changing the way you eat, and then changing the way you live and move. So exercise is also a great way to build up that gut bacteria. Fiber is the food 
that the gut bacteria eat. And guess, 90 plus percent of, of Americans don't get enough fiber. So these gut bacteria are starving to death. 90 plus percent of people are not getting enough fiber, the food for our gut bacteria. And then we wonder why we're sad. We wonder why we're bloated. We wonder why we're gaining weight. We wonder why as a society, we're getting sicker. That gut brain connection is such a key connection in our overall health. Adding more fiber to your diet includes having more fruits and vegetables. That's the best way. The stocks of the vegetables are high in fiber. There's also fiber in certain fruits. Berries are a great source of fiber. We have fiber in grains, whole grains, oats, seeds, nuts. Fiber is in a lot of these foods that I also mentioned that are also the less processed foods. So the spinach, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the chia seeds, the seeds and nuts, this is where you get your fiber. If you go on MyFitnessPal, this is an easy way to do this, okay? If you go on MyFitnessPal and you put in a dailies, all your foods for the day, you can see how much fiber on average you're getting. The minimum amount of fiber that you should be getting is 25 grams, but I want you to aim for 30 to 40 grams a day. If you can get 30 to 40 grams a day, you are in great shape for rebuilding your gut microbiome. And it's not as hard as you think. When you start to eat more salads, you start to add more vegetables to your meals, more seeds, more nuts, you start to see that that fiber really does add up. And then the last part of the 3F morning is the protein. So I mentioned to you, you know, during perimenopause, you start to lose muscle mass. And it's really sad because you could be doing the same exercises. You could be doing the same things you always did. You could be eating the same foods, but your muscle mass is decreasing over time and you have to take control over it. You have to start doing more resistance training and you have to start eating adequate protein. Someone like me, I'll be honest, I thought I was eating really healthy. And then I started tracking my food and I noticed, you know, the fiber was getting up there. I was doing a pretty good job, but my protein level was abysmal. So people often ask me, how much protein should you eat? How much protein you should eat is a hotly debated topic. And you'll see people saying, oh my God, Americans are eating too much protein or oh my God, Americans are not eating enough protein. Here's where I stand. For the woman in perimenopause, if you are actively trying to build muscle and trying to kind of stop this catastrophic muscle loss, you need to have adequate protein. And if you're someone who is actively trying to build muscle, you may even need more. So you may need 0.8 to one gram per ideal body weight. So one gram per pound ideal body weight is something like 100 to 150 grams of protein a day for a perimenopausal woman. Now that might sound like a lot and it is, and it's only for people who want to actively build muscle and you're getting it from high quality sources. You may want to stick to closer to the 100 to the 120 grams a day, you know, in the beginning, let your body get used to it. And I actually am in that range all the time. I'm trying to always get up to 100 and you want to really base it on your activity level. If you're not very active, you probably don't need that much protein, but you definitely need more than what most people think. For me, I was getting 50 grams of protein or less a day in perimenopause. That is not something that you want to do. In perimenopause, you want to keep your protein levels closer to that 0.8 to one gram per pound, and that's ideal body weight. So if you're 150 pounds, but you really should be for your height or want to be 130 pounds, you would use that as your gauge. So you're talking about between, for most people, you're talking about between 90 and 120 grams of protein every single day if you're actively trying to build muscle. So then the next question is, how the heck do you get that much protein in your diet? That is a great question. It starts with having a high protein breakfast. You want to have between 20 and 40 grams of protein in your breakfast so that you can get up to those higher numbers throughout the day. How do you get 20 to 40 grams of protein in your breakfast? Well, that's one of the reasons I created the protein chai is I wanted something really easy to add in my day when I'm in a rush filming days like this or travel days, 20 grams of protein, hundred calories and you're done. When you have time in most days, I actually make a breakfast, a tofu or egg scramble will get get you up to 25 to 30 grams of protein. You can add beans, black beans to it. You can add edamame to it. These are great ways to add up the protein. This is something that you should be having every morning 
get your vegetables, get your protein, get your fermented food, and you have a high protein breakfast. You start off your day in the most wonderful way. If you did nothing else, at least you started your day off with a 3F morning and a beautiful breakfast, get you energized and even for the day. Having a high protein, high fiber probiotic breakfast was a game changer in my life. And so I wanted to share that with you. Okay, let's get into some superfoods. Some nutrition research has come out with, you know, these foods that really add a nutritional punch and have science behind them. I think the first one is something that a lot of you are familiar with, and that is magnesium. Magnesium in your diet is beneficial for cancer, for inflammation, for brain health, for muscle health. There are so many things that magnesium can do. Magnesium is very high in nuts and seeds and beans leafy greens. You should get most of it from your diet. You can also supplement with it. You know I love magnesium glycinate for its ability to lower cortisol, help with sleep, help with that anxiety, increasing that GABA. Magnesium glycinate is something that I have regularly in my diet, but I also try to have a high magnesium nutritional plan. Okay. You won't believe this, but for every 100 grams of magnesium you eat, you have a drop in 24% in pancreatic cancer risk. You also, the highest intake of magnesium has a 40% decreased risk of all-cause mortality. The highest intake of magnesium has a 50% decrease in cancer mortality. 550 milligrams of magnesium a day was protective for the brain. It helps the brain grow and it helps the brain against dementia. Magnesium is something that you can easily add into your diet, into your life to get up to that highest dose. Another superfood that you should be adding to your diet is blueberries. Blueberries are amazing in their ability to improve mood, cognition, protect against dementia. One cup of blueberries a day is enough to create these changes. In fact, studies show that one cup of blueberries almost instantly, within an hour, makes you smarter. One cup of blueberries makes you smarter within an hour. I mean, if you're not blown away by this, I don't know what else I can tell you, but things like blueberries have polyphenols, have fiber. These are foods that are less process, not process at all, that can help you in ways that we're just understanding now. Another game changer is cacao powder or cocoa powder, or sometimes even dark chocolate. Eating one tablespoon of unprocessed cocoa powder for 12 weeks was able to increase muscle strength. Imagine that you could increase your muscle strength and mass by just one spoon of cocoa powder a day. This is unprocessed dark cocoa powder. You can make it into a drink. You can add it to your foods. You can make it into a pudding. You can have it in your desserts. I mean, who doesn't love cocoa, right? Now, this is the natural, unprocessed, dark cocoa, okay? We're not talking about taking a whole bunch of Snickers or Twix and eating it for your brain health. I love the idea that drinking dark cocoa is enough to improve blood flow. It is improves uh, vascular stem cells by 50%. It actually improves heart health. Now, of course, the problem with cocoa is that it's often processed with lots of milk, lots of sugar. And even for me, it's sometimes hard to differentiate between healthy cocoa and unhealthy. So the best way to do it is to use unprocessed dark cocoa powder in your cooking, 100% or 80% in your cooking, in your baking, or in your drinks, because it's really hard to find high quality dark chocolates that actually have this effect. Another superfood you could be adding to your diet is tea. Tea is something that has shown to decrease mortality. Three cups a day can actually decrease your mortality by 24%. In one hour after consuming tea, you see genoprotective effects. It lowers DNA damage. Tea has antioxidants, especially green tea, but also black tea has antioxidants that can be protective for your brain, for your heart, and for your DNA. Coffee actually also has very similar effects on our body. It is very good for our brain and also cuts mortality risk. But you might be asking, well, Dr. Shah, didn't you say in perimenopause you might be more sensitive to caffeine? Great question. Caffeine can be really, really difficult to tolerate in perimenopause. In fact, people like me can't have caffeine afternoon. So 
How do you reconcile this data about tea and coffee? And you're telling me these are good for me, but then you're telling me it's not good for me. So what I would recommend is having your tea and coffee first thing in the morning and not necessarily even first thing after an hour after you wake up and then stopping at noon. So that might be a very small window for some of you. But really what happens is when you have it in the morning, it helps you with your alert. It will help you with all of these genoprotective effects. It has the antioxidant effects, but it won't affect your sleep and it won't affect your anxiety levels, especially if you're sensitive to caffeine. For some of you, you might be wondering, why did I say wait an hour before you have your caffeine in the morning? And then you're saying, don't have it afternoon. Well, here's the thing. When you first wake up in the morning, you have a lot of adenosine in your receptors in your brain. And it's because you're clearing that out. You're feeling groggy. You want to let that clear out before you have your first cup of caffeine. And the reason why is that if you have a cup of coffee, as soon as you wake up, you go and occupy those adenosine receptors. And that adenosine doesn't have a chance to clear out of your brain. And so what you get is after the coffee wears off and it does wear off, you get exaggerated fatigue and sleepiness. So if you're someone who really suffers from a post-coffee slump, so like late morning, early afternoon slump, you want to wait to have your first caffeine for about 60 to 90 minutes from the time you wake up. And then on top of that, if you're someone who's sensitive to caffeine, you're in perimenopause, you have trouble sleeping, or you're having anxiety issues, or you're having palpitations, or the host of things that caffeine can cause, you want to stop caffeine about 10 hours before you're going to bed. So for some of us, that's literally 12 or 11. And so you have a very short window that you can actually have the caffeine, get the benefits and not have the side effects. But that's something I really you know, do. And if I'm doing something in the afternoon, I often choose decaf. Remember, decaf does have a little bit of caffeine, but it won't disturb you as much as the caffeinated products. If you are someone who doesn't need caffeine, that's okay. Decaffeinated green tea, decaffeinated tea has some of the same effects as a caffeinated version. In fact, the protein chai is decaffeinated. You can add some tea to it if you'd like, but and to give it a little caffeine boost if you're someone who's having it in that window, but you can also have it as is in the afternoon or evening because it's decaffeinated. So let's put it all together. You've heard me talk about the 3F morning, the overnight fasting, circadian fasting, the fitness, getting some sunlight, some steps in, and then the food. We've really concentrated on the food portion, the fiber, the probiotic food, and the protein in your first meal of the day, and then you rinse and repeat for the rest of the day. So if you're someone like me who has a very, very busy schedule, I'm constantly thinking, how am I going to get my fiber, my protein, my probiotic food in my next meal? And if you constantly just have those questions in your mind, you will choose better options. If you're out, you can choose a salad, you can have a protein, and then you might have a yogurt or fermented food on the side. The probiotic food is a little bit harder when you're eating out. Often you'll have to do that when you get home, but it's totally doable. And that's how I structure my day to get adequate protein, to get adequate fiber, to get adequate probiotic foods. I would aim for at least two probiotic foods a day. That could be a spoon of sauerkraut and a serving of yogurt and you're done with your two. That's how I structure the day. Now, all of these other superfoods I talked to you about, those are all things that you can start to add on as you get these basics down. So if you're wondering where should I start, I would say start with the 3F morning and work yourself from there. You know, I definitely want to emphasize some of the things I didn't get to. There's so many things that you should be including in your diet that we didn't cover in this episode, but I'll name a couple of them. Vitamin D, you want to be including more vitamin D rich foods. You want to be including more omega-3, more omega-3 rich foods in your diet. Vitamin D and omega-3 are another two micronutrients that can really help during this time of perimenopausal transition. Once, you know, there's so many other things, but these are kind of the basic perimenopausal protocol for your diet. So Dr. Amy, what would you do if you're waking up and you want to structure your day in a way? Let me give you an example of my day, okay? I wake up in the morning and I will go out for a quick walk or at least get a few minutes of sunlight or stretching. Could be as little as two minutes, okay, on busy days. I try to force myself to just get the couple minutes and then come inside. So, and then I'm calculating how many hours has it been since my last meal. I try to make it at least 12 hours. And then I have my caffeine usually an hour after getting up. 
So I'll do my morning routine and then I'll have my caffeine about 60 to 90 minutes after waking up. And usually that's a tea. And then I will make a breakfast and that will be timed again, you know, 12 to 14 hours after I've eaten my last meal. And that is something that has fiber, that has protein, that has probiotic foods. So something I typically go to is a scramble, a veggie egg white scramble with some sauerkraut or probiotic cottage cheese on the side. I'll often have a kombucha as a snack, like a drink for fun that I'll take with me to see patients in the clinic. And when I have my second meal of the day, I try to make it a salad with protein and fermented food again. I often add some fruit, berries on there. I'm often figuring out other ways to include spices in my meals because I know the benefit of spices. And I grew up in a culture where spices were revered. In the South Asian culture, we know very well that spices not only are aromatic and tasty, but they have health benefits. And the science has really started to catch up to that. So I'm really trying to incorporate spices into my meals. I mean, turmeric is medicinal food. It is something that can improve your arterial health as good as exercise, as seen in some studies. So you want to be including spices. Spice Spices also work as prebiotics, so they're like fiber. They help feed the gut bacteria. So you want to be including spices in your food. You want a lot of diversity in your food, so try to get different spices to try. A Trader Joe's is great for that. Um, different types of spice mixes to add to your foods, um, and that's how you can structure kind of the second meal of your day. It can be a spicy scramble again, or soup, or a salad. And then the third meal of the day is, again, one of the S's, soup, scramble, shake, salad, a stew, something that has vegetables in it, fiber in it, protein in it. And that is how you can hit your goals for the day. Sometimes for me, that second and third meal kind of mesh together in a late afternoon meal and that's okay. And that for me, it helps because then I just really have a snack before I start my fast for the evening. And so this is a way you can structure your day. Notice I didn't mention alcohol. Um, Alcohol is something that I'm not including in my life on a daily basis. New data shows that you should be including it three times a week or less on average in order to improve your brain health and heart health. So there may be a magic middle in terms of anti-inflammatory effects and not having deleterious brain effects. And that's around that two to three a week. But if you're someone who doesn't enjoy alcohol or doesn't get any benefit from alcohol, you're just as good having no alcohol in your week. And so that's really how I structure my week. That's how I structure my meals. That's how I structure my advice to anyone who I'm working with. And so I hope you found a value in this perimenopausal protocol for nutrition. I hope that you will put it into play. I hope that you'll start the 3F morning. I hope that you'll incorporate more probiotic foods, fibrous foods, and protein-rich foods into your life. I hope that you'll eat more whole foods that are not processed. I hope that you will be getting more movement and sunlight and all the things that go with a good nutritional plan. I hope that you're sleeping and you're fasting and you're happy. You're spending time with people you love. These are all important parts of your nutritional plan. So that being said, I want to conclude this episode by thanking you so much for being such amazing, amazing community for giving us reviews for downloading the podcast, for telling your friends about it, for watching the YouTube version. I've created this resource to be a no cost to your resource so you can improve your life. The purpose of this is so that you can live a longer, healthier life and that the second half of your life will be the best half of your life. So thanks again for watching and listening. This is Save Yourself with Dr. Amy Shaw.